Welcome back everybody to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce a friend and colleague from the University of Antwerp. Mike Kestemont is a research associate professor at the Department of Literature at the University of Antwerp. He specializes in computational text analysis for the computational humanities. His work has a strong focus on historic literature and his previous research has covered a wide range of topics in literary history, including classical, medieval, early modern and modernist texts. Together with Volkert Karstorp and Alan Riddle, he has just published a textbook on data science for the humanities with Princeton University Press. Mike recently took up interest in ecology and how its quantitative methods can be meaningfully be applied to the study of culture. Mike also lives in Brussels and if you don't know it, he is also author of two novels in Dutch. So if you have time, I definitely recommend to read them. So today it's a great pleasure to have him here as our invited speaker and his presentation is entitled Ecology and Cultural Heritage, Modeling the Historic Survival of Books and Authors with Unseen Species Models. Mike, great pleasure to have you here and the stage is yours. Thank you so much for that, uh, that kind introduction. It's a pleasure, as always, to, to see you again. And thanks for the opportunity to, to present this talk, uh, which I hope um, to be able to demonstrate how we can apply methods from ecology in the study of um, maybe surprisingly cultural uh, heritage. And uh, the case study that I will focus on today is historic literature specifically, and even more specifically, in fact, the historic literature that did not survive, which might be a bit weird, but um, from, from a broader perspective, what, what I hope to challenge today is this big divide that still exists between on the one hand, biology and its study, and on the other hand, uh, culture and uh, its study. And I believe that precisely the use of, of digital and computational methods, in fact, allows us to, to bridge that gap. Um, today, I'm going to report on work that is, that is joint work, collaborative work with a, a large number of people that I will um, show you uh, downstream in the talk, uh, but especially with my um, um, co-author, uh, Volgert Kaxdorf, who is a, a senior researcher um, at an institute in Amsterdam. And I've been working with him on these problems for a, a while now. We've also presented our work a couple of times uh, already. Each time we make a little progress in the code, in the data, etc. cetera. Uh, but I'm very happy to share with you uh, today where uh, we stand. Um, First, I wanted to say a few things on this, this curious mix, maybe, of, of literature, historic literature and ecology. So I'm, I guess that some of you have an idea already of, of the kind of things that are being studied uh, in ecology. But just to, to set uh, the stage, I, I include a, a definition here of, of what people do in ecology from a statistical textbook by Kiri and Schaub that I, that I read a while back. And it goes like this, it says, ecology is concerned with the number or abundance, and as they call it in ecology, of living things. So how many individuals are there? How did their number evolve over time? Where were they? Where do they go to? And important questions concern the interaction of these living things with on the one hand, abiotic stuff, and on the other hand, um, biotic uh, aspects of the uh, environment, so other animals, for instance. Um, and what people like to study there is the interaction between these individuals, but also the, the mechanism that, that drive their numbers, that explain uh, their numbers and their, their evolution, their dynamics, so to speak. Um, so what, what Folgate and I have been doing now for, I think, the past two years is, is explore whether we can make a drop-in replacement here uh, when it comes to literary studies, more specifically medieval literary studies. So 
how does this sound? Medieval literary studies is concerned with the number or abundance of, of literary works from the Middle Ages. How many manuscripts do we have of these texts? How did their number evolve over time? Where do they come from and where did they go? And how did these uh, works and manuscripts um, interact with, uh, with their environment, etc.? Um, so th this pretty much uh, sums up our, our current research program, you could say, where we are trying to find out how meaningful it is uh, to take methodologies from ecology and apply them to medieval texts, medieval literature, as if these texts, these works were living creatures that were part of a, a larger ecosystem, you could say, of medieval uh, literature. Um, so far, this, this has been a very rewarding experience for us. We've learned a lot. And there's one insight in particular that, that I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about, and that relates to the following. And I'm, I'm citing again here from that uh, Kelly and Schaub uh, textbook. And what, what is particularly interesting is that ecologists increasingly acknowledge that their work involves a, a two-tier process. So what you have is an, an actual ecological state S in the world. Uh, you can see the little circles, that's S. Uh, but the problem is that um, this uh, state that evolves over time, uh, we never get to properly observe that because our, our observation, those are the, the little O's, uh, the squares uh, in the illustration, is imperfect. So you have the actual number of, of polar bears, for instance, on the North Pole, so to speak. And then there's the number of polar bears that you somehow got to observe. And um, those are completely different things. Um, and much of what statisticians do in ecology is in fact directed at correcting their own observations. Why? Because they know that they can't trust them. They know that their observations are imperfect. And uh, I found that a very inspiring uh, principle, this uh, distinction between on the one hand, the true ecological state, uh, the mechanisms that you really want to study, but also acknowledging there's this second tier of, of the observational mechanisms that are in place, the, the lens through which you can actually look at these phenomena. And I think that if you, if you fully acknowledge that distinction, if you embrace it in a way, then I think that the way you practice science um, radically changes. And I know that this might sound a bit abstract at this, uh, at this stage, but I hope that by the end of the talk, you, you will understand better uh, why I mean, uh, what I mean uh, with this. Um, I am going to go back to that um, picture on our opening slide, um, which was there on, on purpose, of course. Everything has a meaning. It's um, Fabrice di Carigine. It's a, a village, 13th century village in, in Tuscany, Italy. And nowadays it is permanently submerged underwater because of the, the construction of a, of a large dam in uh, the neighborhood. And when the, the, the lake is... Uh, temporarily drained, you, you can sometimes uh, catch a glimpse of, of the village. Um, but most of the time, normally, you can only see, like here, a couple of towers, a couple of roofs. And you could say that it is a kind of modern Atlantis, if you will, a sunken city. Um, so I think that this village is, is an excellent metaphor for the, the main problem that we are, in fact, confronting today. And that is the fact that uh, the study of the history of, of human culture, broadly speaking, is hindered by the fact that we have lost a great deal of things. A great deal of material artifacts uh, from previous centuries uh, do not survive anymore. And this is true across many areas in the humanities and history. And this is also true for pre-modern literature and medieval literature, which is my, my focus um, today. So very basically, we have lost a lot of books over the centuries, and that could have been uh, because of accidents like bombs or fires, um, but it could also uh, have been the, the result of an intentional process. So we see that the libraries, for instance, they still do that. They often uh, dispose of duplicates actively, and uh, that's another way in which you can lose books through in intentional losses, uh, so to speak. And um, this sort of explains our idea of an Atlantis, so when you work with historic literature, the only thing you can work with is the stuff that still exists. And that's a, a very incomplete sample. Potentially, probably, it's a very biased uh, sample um, of, a, of an original population of historic literature that was once uh, much larger, much more diverse. So that, that is the main problem in a way. Um, and I think it's striking how, how narratives of, of loss 
um, have become ubiquitous, you could say, in, in recent mainstream uh, culture. So to the left here, I'm, I'm showing a trailer uh, of, a, of a fairly recently launched documentary uh, on Netflix by say, Sir David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet. And, and that whole movie that is also kind of a, a biopic uh, in a way, uh, revolves around that dramatic loss in, in biodiversity that our planet is currently experiencing. So, so life as such, the, the number of animals isn't uh, maybe diminish diminishing right now. Um, but what is certainly uh, diminishing is the diversity of life uh, on Earth. And that's, um, we should worry about that for, for a number of reasons. And uh, a very similar argument is made in, in Sapiens. Uh, you probably know that book, popular science book by Yuval Harari. And uh, there the, the, the far reaching impact of, of, of human life on the planet's ecological system is also a, a recurrent motif, you could say. So in our times, I think interestingly, uh, global ideologies of expansion and growth um, seem to be making room for, for new kinds of narrative that focus more on, on loss, on, on shrinkage uh, even. And I think that the story today is also uh, revolving around this idea of, of loss, but then not loss in biodiversity, but in, in cultural uh, diversity. And in that, I think that this, this research program is certainly reminiscent of, of uh, eco-criticism, which is a kind of uh, certain branch uh, in literary studies that is also uh, becoming um, quite prominent nowadays. Um, okay. So I know that you are not uh, medievalists, so I'm going to review very schematically some of, of the routes, of the many routes, via which medieval literature uh, has been preserved or has been uh, forgotten. That's what is shown schematically here on this slide. This isn't specific to uh, any kind of literature. This is, I think, uh, true for, for most of the medieval literature. So what we have to the left is a series of circles and these are the distinct works um, that have been uh, written in the, the Middle Ages. Um, and um, each work has been copied into at least one document, you could say. Often these are manuscripts. Um, but often, you can see, and that's what, what is shown in the second column, um, these uh, works were copied into more um, textual carriers, witnesses, or documents. In the simplest case, like, like in the first row, you can see that a, a document uh, would survive and then would end up in some kind of repository, like a private collection, an archive, a library. And those are the, the, the large gray areas uh, that you see uh, to the right. Um, some manuscripts, on the other hand, will have been completely destroyed, maybe, maybe in a fire or so. Or what is also possible is that they have yet to re-emerge, right? Because they, they still exist, but we haven't found them back yet. They haven't been recovered yet. If you look at the examples in row two and uh, four, for instance, you will see that these are both cases of what we call, could call lost works. What, what do we call a lost work? It's a work for which all of the associated documents have been destroyed or they have not been recovered yet, at least. So the crucial message here that you can take from this slide is that we have these abstract works at the gray circles to the right. And then um, we have attestations of these works in at least one, but potentially more uh, documents. Those are the little book symbols in the second column. And uh, these books can have survived or not. Um, often you see that these, these beautiful uh, manuscripts don't survive in, a, in an unscathed fashion. So parchment, uh, material that was often used to produce books, is in fact, uh, it's a very solid uh, material. It ages uh, really well. And we see that after the Middle Ages, early modern period, um, the parchment from these books was often recycled for other purposes. That's, of course, a very ecological uh, thing to do, but it's really insane to see what people have sometimes done uh, to these uh, books. Uh, the, there's a very famous fragment to the left here. Uh, it's actually a, a part of a parchment book that was uh, reused uh, to strengthen the mitre of a bishop in later times. And it's kind of a funny idea that this person was running around with uh, some fairly erotic uh, literature on his, in his, on his head. So these are just a couple of examples um, to, to see that the survival of these documents is often defective, as we call it. Um, today, I'm going to start from a very small case study, Middle Dutch literature, and I'm going to assume that you don't know much about medieval Dutch literature. 
Um, so th this is the vernacular literature that has been written in, in the Low Countries, Flanders and the Netherlands during the, the medieval period. More specifically, um, we are going to look at what we call Ritter Epic, Ritter Epic. Uh, so the chivalric romances, you could say, that, that contain the, the kind of um, fiction, narrative fiction, that is very typical of the Middle Ages. Like, for instance, the, the legends about King Arthur and his knights. So in, in Middle Dutch, what we have currently is 75 works in this, in this genre. And uh, taken together, these works survive in 167 documents. So here again, what is important is this difference between the abstract work and then the material documents in which that work has been copied. That is a crucial distinction. Uh, before we had the printing press, all copies of works were produced uh, by hand. They were hand copied. And most of these documents are, are, are manuscripts, parchments, manuscripts, and then later also paper manuscripts. Um, um, this is a sample. We know much of this literature has been lost. And what we would like to know is how much of this literature was originally there. And uh, we have some estimates that scholars have published in, in the past. There's, for instance, an influential literary history not so long ago that stated that uh, we now have um, 75 works, but originally there must have been at least 100 works because we know that a lot of stuff disappeared. Um, we also have estimates uh, regarding the loss of documents, right? So this is, again, that important difference, loss of works versus loss of documents. And uh, book historians have estimated that on average, um, there would be about 7% uh, of medieval books that, that still survive. Uh, nowadays. That's not uh, much a lot, but we are going to use um, these numbers as, as a sort of baseline in our study, you could say, as, as, as a prior, maybe. Um, so from a scientific point of view, what, what is the problem here? What is the pressing issue? It's the, the fact that there is bias here. So as, as medievalists, I'm a medievalist, we, we are biased in our work towards the stuff that actually survived. And in a way that makes sense because we, we have to work with what we have, right? There's, there's no alternative. But the thing is that because of this bias, we underestimate the original diversity of the literature and we have to correct that in some way. So we, we have this underestimation that we have to account for somehow. So how did we do that? So as, as you know already, we turned to ecology um, for this. Um, and um, in ecology, a, a central concept is ecodiversity or species richness. That's a crucial concept. So for, for very many reasons, uh, ecologists uh, want to know how many distinct species live in a certain area that could help them monitor, for instance, the, the impact of a, an ecological disaster, like maybe the, the recent wildfires in, in Australia. So th they want to know how many distinct species live in a certain area. So how do they do that? How do they estimate that? They send in a team of observers, you could say, who are going to cover a certain area during a, a couple of weeks, maybe months, could be longer. And they're going to use a harmless uh, trapping devices or other counting um, uh, equipment like cameras maybe. And they are literally going to start counting animals. Of course, they are going to observe a lot of um, insects, I don't know, smaller mammals. Um, but the problem is that uh, they are very likely to miss many species in that uh, campaign, especially if it's limited in time. So you can think of animals that are more difficult to spot, like maybe a tiger or a, a slow leopard. These are animals that are hard to, to sight. Uh, and that is a major issue because these ecologists, once they have finished their bio registration campaign, they know that their counts are inaccurate. So like medievalists, you could say, they know that they are in fact underestimating the actual richness and, and diversity of the species that live in that area. And that explains why um, they try to account for the unseen species as they call it in a, in a sample. And for this purpose, ecology has developed a very rich tradition of statistical methods. Um, in our work so far, we have focused on a, a specific model, a specific uh, unseen species model um, that is called Cha Wan, which was developed by, by An, An Chao, a Taiwanese um, biostatistician. And uh, to apply this method, 
um, what you need to do is represent your data as so-called abundance data. So what does that mean? You have to record how often each species has been cited in a campaign. And you can see a fictional example here uh, of such a table to the right, an abundance, abundance table. And in this example, you see that there's 45 sp uh, species that were uh, spotted only once, cited only once during the campaign. And you can see that there was only one species that was observed up to 17 times. And this is not an atypical uh, situation, not an atypical distribution in ecology. Now, in, um, in um, uh, this model, what is very important is what they call singletons and doubletons. So singletons are the number of species that you have cited exactly once. Um, and doubletons are the number of species that have been ex uh, cited exactly twice. And these are uh, what we call F1 and F2 in the Chow's formula that you can see um, on this slide. And the main assumption here is that um, the, the number of low frequency um, uh, species, so singletons and doubletons, inform you, tell you something about the number of species that you did not observe. So mathematically speaking, what we do is we take F1 and F2 and we estimate F0. And F0 is kind of a, a funny thing. It's the number of species that are out there but that you have cited exactly zero times. And that's, um, that's actually the, the core property that you try to estimate here using this uh, formula. Um, so this isn't super relevant, but it's, it's kind of interesting to know that this, this method, SHA-1, is in fact um, directly based on the, on the code breaking work by, by Alan Turing in World War II. It's uh, closely related to what they call the Turing good estimate or good Turing estimate in information theory. And uh, Turing and his colleagues, in, in, in fact, were also confronted with situations where they had to guess, estimate how likely it was that they would encounter, I don't know, maybe an encrypted word that they had not encountered yet uh, so far. So that's maybe unexpected but for the uh, uh, petite histoire. It's interesting to know that this uh, formula for Chai one, uh, Chai one is directly based on, on the formulas that were developed for a similar purpose at uh, Dutchley uh, Park. Okay, so the, the core question now is whether we can also take this method and, and apply it to, for instance, our Middle Dutch data. Okay, can we do that? So we believe that this is possible, but if you want to believe that too, you, you will have to accept um, the following analogy um, together with us. So this is what you have to accept to make this little trick work if you want. So what we are going to say is that distinct works are distinct species in medieval literature. And then we have the number of surviving documents for each work. And we will see that as, as, a, as a kind of proxy for the number of, of sightings that you have of, a, of an animal species during a, a bioregistration campaign. And here too, same assumption holds, namely that the number of works with a very low survival frequency can inform us as to the number of works that we did not cite at all. So the, the lost books, if you will. Um, you can even take that analogy a little bit further and say that the libraries uh, or the archives in which these books are currently kept are, are um, similar to the traps that are being used in, in ecology. And they have all sorts of interesting models for that, but I, I, I think it's a kind of a, a fun model where you say that libraries should be seen as, as book traps. That's an interest, instrument to catch books. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Okay, so, so what happens if, if you do this? What happens if you apply this method to our Middle Dutch uh, example? What you see here is um, something that's well known in ecology. It's, it's called a species accumulation curve, long word. And this uh, sums up the result, you could say. So you can see that there's a blue line there. And there we, we plot the number of works on the vertical axis as a function of the number of documents on the horizontal axis. And this basically shows you how many new works you are going to find as you sample or discover more documents, manuscripts. And there's a solid part to the line to the left. That's the situation as we, as we can observe it nowadays. Remember, we have, what is it, um, 75 works. And um, there's also a dashed by, uh, line. And that dashed line sort of offers a peek into uh, the future, you could say, because it, it shows you what would happen if we were to continue finding uh, more manuscripts into infinity, theoretically speaking. You can see that this curve is, is asymptotic. It starts to 
flatten out at a given point. And um, there's a certain saturation that, uh, that kicks in at a certain point. And that curve basically uh, tells you um, how many works there were as estimated by this model. So originally this model estimates that there's a, a little over 150, so 152 texts um, uh, were originally part of this Middle Dutch corpus and only half of that would survive today. You can also see that there's a, a shaded light blue region that gives you a, a confidence interval. It's a pretty wide confidence interval, as you can see. Um, but in any case, what this result suggests is that we shouldn't be uh, too optimistic. So this estimate that only 25% of the works would have survived today seems um, a bit too conservative, you could say. I think that this model gives us uh, ground to uh, reject the optimism and uh, probably at least half and, and probably even more of the works in, in this literature are now uh, lost, which is bad news, of course. Um, so when it comes to previous work, I think there's a, a big gap here in between uh, the loss of works and the loss of, of documents. So for the loss of works and, and then specifically for the medieval period, there has been very little uh, empirical work let alone quantitative work. So we, we only found a single paper that um, does something uh, related for uh, Italian polyphonic manuscripts. Very interesting paper, but just the one we think. Um, what you see on the other hand in book history for the loss of, of, of documents, um, um, there is more work. Um, if you look at broader book history, not just medieval book history, there's a, there's a pioneering paper, I think, by, by Ege and Kurt, who developed a very similar uh, method, but for um, printed uh, works. And that's a, a problem there because their formula that they have applies on an estimation of the print run. So the number of uh, books that were um, uh, printed in one go, um, so to speak. But uh, this parameter that they call alpha is, is not available for medieval books. Why? Because the concept of a print run is, is, doesn't make sense there. All of these books were um, produced individually. So um, that's why we couldn't apply, um, or it made less sense to apply their model, so to speak. Um, so in, in book history and for document loss, we are on, on better grounds. And there has been quite a bit of, of statistical work, empirical work. Most of that work is based on uh, medieval library catalogs. Um, so libraries of which, the, uh, of which we know the historic composition because the, the catalogs survive. And of course, if you can still identify these manuscripts, you can basically calculate the survival ratio of uh, these books. So there has been some work on the basis of this, um, but um, that's uh, problematic often because these um, lists or catalogs are pretty rare. Yeah? Not, not many survive. And often they come from a very privileged in, environment, like maybe a monastery or so. So it doesn't, it's, it's hard to tell how representative these numbers are uh, for other collection uh, environments. And it would be interesting if we could uh, compare these numbers to, to um, other estimates that are obtained in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so remember, we have Cha one we applied that, that's our unseen species model. And in our analogy, we argue that it can tell us something about the loss of medieval works. Now, equally relevant in medieval studies, especially, is the number of lost ma uh, manuscripts or documents. So bluntly put, how, how big was this original population of manuscripts that once existed? And for answering that question, there's a, an interesting extension of, of Chow's method from a paper in 2009. And that was originally meant to inform field workers um, as to how they were doing on a registration campaign in ecology. Okay, so suppose that we have um, established F0 and the number of um, species that we didn't spot. What, what this model is going to try and estimate is how many additional sightings you have to do to observe each of these species at least once. So it's a very interesting method because you can argue, and that is, that is what we do, um, that this number, so the number of minimum additional sightings that you need, uh, can give you an idea of the number of lost manuscripts. And that's especially attractive because we can indeed assume that the bulk of medieval works, especially the ones that we haven't observed yet, indeed survive in very low uh, quantities. Um, so our reasoning is that if you have seen every work at least once, that implies that you probably also have seen most documents. 
Um, so here, simply put, um, how many more documents, manuscripts, what we have to find back from the Middle Ages uh, in order to see all of these works of which we think that they have been lost. So again, here we have a graph, a species accumulation curve. And um, what we are basically or informally uh, trying to estimate here is, is the point when the saturation starts to kick in in the asymptotic uh, curve. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's how you can think about it. Um, so what you see is that you have a green blob here, uh, which so it shows you the kernel density estimates um, for the original number of, of documents. And as shown by the, the vertical line, it has a bit of left skew, as you can see. Um, this, this method suggests that originally there were over 2,200 manuscripts containing Middle Dutch chivalric romances. And of these, according to this latest estimate that we have, only 7.5% uh, would survive. Um, I was very surprised when I, when I first did this analysis because um, we have these earlier estimates, as I told you, from book historians, and they suggested a survival factor of about 7% for uh, non-illustrated books, so not uh, the high-end stuff, you could say, from the Middle Ages, the kind of manuscripts in which vernacular texts like this Middle Dutch chivalric romance would typically uh, survive. And I found it pretty astonishing that sort of out of the blue, this method gives you um, a very, very similar estimate, uh, 7.5 versus 7, um, that is really in, in the same ballpark as what book, book historians have previously um, published, but on the basis of a completely different data source. So when it comes to the survival of, of, of documents, manuscripts, you can see that this method uh, really corroborates previous research, which I think is, is very uh, valuable. Um, so, so by now you <laughs> will have understood that I'm a big fan of medieval Dutch literature. Um, but if we're being honest, Dutch is a, a smaller language. It's also a smaller language in, in the Middle Ages. It's of comparatively low prestige, especially in comparison to French, for instance. Uh, French, the lingua franca of the Middle Ages, uh, had a much higher uh, prestige also internationally. And, th and that raises an obvious question, right? So um, these numbers that we have for Middle Dutch, how would they compare um, to numbers for other literatures? And to answer that question, we're now setting up, um, or we have set an international group of, of, of experts. We're trying to obtain and analyze similar data sets for other medieval literatures. Right now we cover the following languages. Here you see all of the colleagues involved, very, very nice group uh, of people who all bring their own expertise to the table. And um, uh, right now we have, apart from Middle Dutch, we have Middle High German, which will be of interest uh, to the audience today, maybe. We have all Old Icelandic, very interesting, Middle French, the Longer Doyle, not the Longer Doc, Longer Doyle. Um, we have Middle English and Irish uh, so far. So I should add a little disclaimer here because this, this last part really only covers work that is in progress, very much in progress. It hasn't been properly reviewed, etc. We're working hard on the code, on the material, and the numbers still shift a lot. Uh, they, they can shift from week to week still. So that's something that I wanted to stress that this is really being done in the, the framework of open science and uh, we are communicating about this stuff as it uh, unrolls. Uh, and why? Because we really think that we, we benefit from uh, the feedback that we can collect uh, along the way. So I'm going to show a couple of results already. Um, if you're interested in following up our work, you can, you can check out the, the Python software package that we're currently developing, Copia, it's called, Latin for abundance. And uh, you will see that it's really easy with this package to apply this to your own data, if you would be interested. So the, the hardest part so far, I won't say much about it, is the delineation of the material, because we started out from a Middle Dutch corpus, which was surprisingly hard to map to, to other uh, literatures, and we are still sort of negotiating um, the, the data sets that will be relevant to compare here. So what we, what we look at is, again, this longer form epic fiction, narrative fiction, or narrative, which is basically the equivalent, you could say, of a modern um, uh, action movie, so to speak. Um, very uh, chivalric, heroic uh, literature. We look at prose and verse, original and translated uh, literature. And uh, again, what does this contain is the kind of vanilla uh, romance, courtly romance um, that, you, that you will know 
uh, from the Middle Ages, like the Arthurian uh, legends, but also maybe more indigenous heroic tellings, like, like the Beowulf uh, in English literature or uh, the Hildebrandslied in, uh, in, in, in German literature. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of higher level statistics on the data as we have collected it so far. In this table, you, you see the number of works S for each of these traditions. You have the number of uh, manuscripts, which is N. And I also include this notorious F1 and F2 because that gives you a pretty good idea already of the kind of abundance that you have for texts in, in, in this literature. I also list the number of, uh, of repositories there. Uh, in which these literatures have been kept. Very interesting, by the way, is uh, the low numbers that we have there for Icelandic and Irish literatures. All of these literatures, or both of these literatures, only survive in, in just 12 repositories each, which is, uh, if you look at German literature, there we have close to 400 re repositories. Um, all right, so um, this is the result as we have it now. It will change. But what, what you see here is normalized survival rates um, for each literature, again, shown with a kernel density estimate for each of the, the six uh, languages. And this is expressed as a number between zero and one because it's a, a survival ratio. We estimate how many works have survived on the left. We estimate how many documents have to survived to uh, the left, uh, the right, sorry. Um, so you have the darker blue blob for Dutch in the middle, and, and that shows you um, that, that Dutch is a pretty average uh, language, you could say, with, as we know, a 50% uh, survival for works. Surprisingly, is, is uh, French, uh, the language of, of high prestige, I think, only does a little bit better than uh, uh, Middle Dutch. If you look at German, comparatively, it has a really high uh, survival rate in either graph. Um, but what I think is most striking in um, these plots is the um, relatively smaller literatures, Icelandic and, and Irish. And they stand out because of pretty remarkable persistence. So they have lost a lot, of course, but comparatively, the loss is, is way uh, more, um, is way smaller than what we see for the other uh, languages. Um, what is very dramatic in this graph, by the way, is the, the result for Middle English literature and the, the high losses that this literature has uh, sustained. So those are the, the green blobs to the left uh, on either uh, graph. You can see that the English here are bottom of the league. Yeah. And that is related to yeah, a very extreme F1 and F2 um, that we already saw in, in the table. Uh, this is hard to explain, so we're still working towards a, a good explanation for this. Um, I don't think that this is a, something that will disappear. But this seems to be a pretty stable result. Now, the, the fact that uh, Icelandic and Irish have such uh, interesting scores, so relatively high survival rates, that's very interesting from a, an ecological perspective. Because if you would ask an ecologist, um, she or he wouldn't be surprised by this because islands have always played a special role in ecology. And it is, is well established that insular areas, more isolated areas on the planet, have always maintained to, uh, have always managed to maintain a higher level of what they call endemic species uh, richness, species diversity. So it's not a coincidence, for instance, that Darwin's Galapagos um, with all their unique species were, were islands, right? That's not a coincidence. So in a way, we should maybe be more um, surprised about the low survival rates in England than, than the high survival rates in Iceland. Uh, but then again, um, England maybe wasn't uh, enough of an island to deserve that title in this context. That the, the channel, after all, was a, a sea that was very easily crossed in the Middle Ages and perhaps even easier, even easier than, than nowadays, given the current political developments. Um, one interesting way to, to compare these literatures is, is this graph, which is um, a graph that shows so-called evenness profiles. It's a bit complicated to explain where that graph comes from, but this is a kind of normalized, uh, what they call hill number profile. It's going to show you the diversity of an assemblage, uh, a literature on the vertical axis, um, for various orders of what they call a Q. And um, the main thing that I want to stress here and that you will probably see is that the curves for Irish and Icelandic, they, be, they behave radically different than, than the other two. So um, you can see that they all start at one 
Um, but where the other, the curve for the other literatures quickly drops, you can see that the two insular curves there stay uh, much higher. And such a, an evenness plot um, essentially is a very complicated way of showing you that in Icelandic and Irish, the distribution of works or of documents over works is much more even. So in, in German literature, for instance, you have a small number of texts, you could say, that eat up all of the, the manuscripts. These are the predators, you could say, in the ecological system. Um, like Wolfram von Eschenbach, they, they, they take all the manuscripts. Um, and what is interesting is that um, these island literatures have a more even distribution of documents over works. And that made them, if you think about it, more resilient to loss in the first place. So think about that if, if you lose an Irish book, it's much less likely that you will also lose a text than when you lose in, uh, a book in Middle English, uh, for instance, because there we have much more singletons. So it's much more sensitive to, to sampling, you could say. So what, what is interesting here is that typically when we think of uh, medieval literature and, and the loss of it, we think of post-medieval factors. We think of the Second World War, fires, that kind of thing. Um, but what we want to draw attention to is that many Evil factors might be just as important. So what this in a way highlights is that the original shape of the distribution, the medieval construction of this literature, uh, might be also a very important uh, factor. Um, one aspect of this is not important, I'm just quickly showing this because it looks nice, is the, the dispersal pattern of these literatures. So here we look where books and fragments for these literatures ended up eventually. So this is the situation as we have it nowadays. And um, what you see in these is geographical heat maps is the diaspora, you could say, of these literatures over the um, European continent. Um, this is very preliminary, but what you see, interestingly, is that French and German, in fact, cover a pretty similar um, area. Um, but if you look at the, the data for Middle English, again, that's, that's very striking. So very few Middle English texts have been preserved on the continent. And this could be related to these low survival rates that we see for Middle English. And what, what you, you could wonder whether migration or the ability to migrate is, is, a, is an important uh, factor here. So this is interesting observation, I think, also still very uh, puzzling. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. What are, what are the contributions that we hope to make with this work? Um, so first of all, there's uh, document loss, the actual lost books. What is interesting there is that our, our numbers pretty much corroborate the previous estimates that we have. And the valuable thing here is that we do this, but with a completely different uh, technique. Um, I think more novel is uh, the fact that for the first time we provide a larger scale estimate of the number of, of lost works uh, from medieval literature. So here we, we didn't even have a real prior. So I think that this, this, this is very novel. This is very promising for the future, I think. Thirdly, as I said in the past, when people have thought about the loss of this literature, they have mainly uh, thought about post-medieval factors uh, like wars and fires, etc. But what we want to highlight is the importance of medieval factors as well, as well because you'd see that uh, the morphology or shape of these literatures already in medieval times um, could make a literature more or less resistant um, to loss, which is, uh, which is important. Um, so that's with that concept of, of, of evenness, right? And then and, and finally, what I, what I hope to push um, um, is maybe a research agenda where ecology and culture are, are studied in a more joint uh, fashion. There's all these interesting analogies and I think that we can learn a lot uh, from, from one another in these fields. So that's it. Uh, many thanks for your attention and I, I'd be happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Mike, thank you very much for this presentation and I do have some applause for you. So. <laughs> I hope you can hear that. Yeah. If you were here, we would knock on, on the table, right? So <laughs> some of this. Uh, yeah, so thanks. This was really a great presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. And there's also plenty of questions in the chat. And um, one thing that, uh, first thing when I saw this is uh, how, how was this work received by other medieval literature scientists. So what did they think about that? That's a completely new approach, isn't it? It, it is new. It is also per perceived as, as pretty new. 
Um, there's a lot of interest. I think people are genuinely interested. They have questions because um, there's a lot of things that we don't consider yet in this model. So one interesting that we're uh, an interesting aspect that we're looking into right now is um, that there are there have been biases in the way these books have survived. So we know, for instance, that uh, books with mini miniatures with a lot of gold, etc., they have a higher survival rate than other books. So that's a typical question that we get. So how do you account for that uh, in this model? So we are now looking into extensions to take into account those those concerns. But we try to take baby steps. So we start from a very simple model and then gradually make it more complex. Yes. So do you think that the length of a manuscript is potentially a factor? That Yeah, definitely. Um, because many of these books survive as fragments. Um, the more pages in a book, the more fragments you, you have. So there, there are yeah, a number of very basic uh, Bayesian aspects to this problem. Uh, you could say, uh, yeah. yeah. So and is this the, the only method to estimate the, the survival? You mentioned one other method, but it wasn't applicable. Are there any other approaches to estimate the numbers that you presented? Yes, there are many. In, in Copia, we implemented a, a couple of them because it's actually it's um, I mean, there's a jungle of estimators out there. Two big families, you have the non-parametric methods and the parametric methods. I have the, uh, the so uh, the non-parametric methods seem to be better estimators in general. So if you want a point estimate, it's better to use a non-parametric method. Um, but these non-parametric methods aren't very expressive. So you can't add any covariates, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, with these illustrated books, if you want to include more variables, I think you eventually will end up with a, a more parametric uh, method. But yes, there is a host of, of methods out there that you can use for this. And would the results then differ a lot? Or um, what's your experience with trying other no. methods? No. So from what we have seen so far, not. Um, so there's a couple of very established approaches. We, we've all compared them. And you get, uh, especially for the second um, part of the talk, you see that uh, the results are in the same ballpark. There's no big changes there. And also the, the stability of the method, if you have a slight change in numbers, uh, then does it have um, a large effect? So there you have to look at the CI, because the CI is based on a bootstrap where you under and over sample um, a distribution. And that gives you an idea of the kind of wiggle. And um, the, the CIs are considerable. So you saw that, right? So there's mm -hmm. a, a pretty big um, uncertainty that you have to account for. Um, but still, also there, you, you see that the, the differences across methods aren't, aren't, aren't big, actually. Yeah. Hmm. It, where did the 7% survival rate come from? Um, was that also computed or just a, a ballpark estimate? Or? So th this is, there's, there's a number of monographs. I, I showed them in the, in the references where people actually look at these medieval library catalogs. And then they see, okay, this medieval library had 100 books. And then they try to trace these books and see whether they still survive. And then they see that seven out of 100 um, still survive. Uh, but yeah, so there's, there's lots of issues with that method. So it's certainly not without problems. Um, but that is where they get these estimates. It's by basically looking how many of the books that were mentioned in the Middle Ages uh, still survive nowadays. It's, a, it's amazing that you get this close from that model. Yeah, I, I think we got a bit lucky there with this data, maybe. Uh, but still, yeah, so it, it's actually reassuring that, that you get something in, in the same range. Wow, well, yeah, uh, that's that's really amazing. So really interesting. So uh, there's, there's one question here. The, the sightings in ecology reflect capability if they're is a bias mistake. For text, sightings reflect quite often an editorial intention. So tweets and retweets, or maybe losing uh, documents or things like that. And uh, sometimes this is not a terrible loss. So how could the chain of curators be modeled? Um, yeah, I, I don't know yet. So we're thinking very hard about this right now. Um, because we don't have much information about this. So this is uh, yeah, so one of these intractable problems, you could say. And we are currently looking into agent-based models to see whether we can have a more sensible um, model of the actual loss. Because the loss now is just a number that we estimate. 
um, it doesn't tell us anything about the qualitative nature of, of the loss and collection biases um, that exist. So this is an, an, an open issue. We are still open to all suggestions. Um, we've been looking at a lot of stuff so far. I don't have any final answers there yet. This is probably the problem that I'll be working on the next 10 years of my life because it is so so complicated. <laughs> Oh, but also exciting. So yes, yes. I, I think that's that's pretty cool how you model this for books. And then, of course, there's a lot of things different with books, like the editorial process and so on. That's not yeah. yet in these models. Yeah. But that's um, it's quite interesting to see that you can tackle the, the completely unseen and with the evidence that you have, it seems to be very convincing. Yeah. So what, what, what's the most frequent critique that comes up when you present this? Um, so I, I think in general, what Cha Wan assumes is that the data is IID. Um, that's definitely not the case. It's partially the case, but we know that there are these collection biases. And I, I think people often have questions about it and they have the feeling like uh, um, you need a model that tells you something also about the way the loss happened. And there you need some sort of mixture model on the one hand of accidental loss and on the other hand of collection biases, you know, books with pictures, that's the, the classic example. So I, I think that people, um, yeah, they care more about um, the quantitative nature of the law. So now they want to know how did it happen? And yeah, we, we have to provide some sort of reconstruction there. Uh, that's also a, another challenging task for the modeling. <laughs> how to do that Definitely, yeah. Yeah, but technically the, the approach as you presented here in particular the one uh, with uh, Chao Wan and that you have been using it seems to be rather straightforward to expand this also to many other things with unobservable events like crime darknet whatsapp groups what's happening there and you know you could model all kinds of things that don't get reported that frequently is that yeah, being used exactly. or, or is, is that common in these fields? Do you happen to know that? It's, it's not that common, actually, because I, I was also expecting this to be used for, and now with COVID, for instance. Eh, the, there's a lot of under detection in the news, actually, right now. So survivorship bias is, is a more general problem. Uh, it's not often, it's not that often used outside ecology. There's a couple of applications in archaeology. Um, but uh, yeah, so maybe I still have to discover uh, these applications, but I, I think this has a much broader applicability than, than just ecology or, or the humanities. Yeah, also, selection bias for academic positions and things like that, which yeah. um, you typically don't talk about. And very yeah, interesting. Do I, mean, I mean, citations are an interesting case, right? The yeah. Number of undetected, undetected citations. Uh, then you can look at the number of works with a very low number of citations. And yeah, so it's. Yeah. Very, very, yeah, really great academic program, great idea. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hear more about this at some point. Also great to have had you here. And I would like to, to thank you with another round of applause. Thank you. So you've seen there have been plenty of questions with Mike and the talk is over now, but of course you can still ask him questions. So if you would like to do that, you can connect with him on social media. He's also very much present on Twitter. And of course you could also send questions to me or leave them here in the comments and I would then forward them to have them answered. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.